I've been a park ranger at Channel Islands National Park for over 10 years now. The park is located off the coast of Southern California, near Los Angeles. I've amassed a number of strange stories over that time, but this takes the cake. Most of my tales are about strange people or usual wildlife encounters. All of them have some reasonable explanation in the end, except for this one. I try to watch out for the park and all of its inhabitants, human and animal. This happened during a routine patrol. Things took an unusual turn to say the least. It was a fine sunny day to start. That piece of paradise we called the Channel Islands was all shades of greens and blues. And against this backdrop of lush nature, there I was, doing my regular checks. Over the years, I've developed a rhythm for these patrols. I check on the wildlife trails we have tracked and maintain our remote cameras, while soaking in the serenity of the park and its unique landscape. This particular day was no different. The sun was warm, the gulls were loud, and the air was salty. The sea was calm as I patrolled along the remote section of the park. It was peaceful, so damn peaceful, considering what was to come. I remember gazing out at the expanse of the Pacific, watching a container ship in the far distance, and thinking how strange it was that two such worlds existed so close to each other. There was minimal activity in the woods that day, just some deer grazing and squirrels scurrying through the bushes. I was finishing up the day's checks, planning to head back when it happened. I wouldn't say I saw it first, but rather I felt it. A gust of a wind picked up, sending a chill down my spine. It was a cold that didn't belong in the sunny weather. The birds seemed to quieten, and a different form of silence took over. Now you might think I'm exaggerating here, but when you've spent a good portion of your life in the wilderness, you learn to heed these signs from nature. I've always believed that our body speaks a language that's older than words, a primitive form of communication that taps into the instincts we hardly use in the civilized world. And my instincts were blaring sirens. Something was off. I scanned the area for what could have caused the sudden change. That's when I noticed ripples dancing across the otherwise still surface of the water. But they weren't like something caused by wind or a moving boat. It was as if something beneath the water was stirring it. As a seasoned ranger, I'm well versed with the diverse marine life around the islands, but this seemed different. I moved closer to the shoreline, curious and cautious. I saw a shadow in the water, a large one. It wasn't quite identifiable, neither a whale nor a school of seals, the usuals we get around here. There was a strangeness about it, something that unsettled the calm sea. This thing, whatever it was, was huge its shadowy form undulating beneath the clear water. It seemed to glide, smoothly, purposefully. But before I could even make out more, it dived deeper into the sea, away from the coast and my prying eyes. You know the funny thing about such unexpected encounters. One moment, you're the watcher, the observer, the protector, and the next, you're nothing but a confused, curious bystander, trying to make sense of the strange hand you've been dealt. I thought that was the end of the wilderness's odd show, but it felt like the calm before a storm. Out of nowhere, a baffling sound cut through that silence. A bellowing roar, thunder-like and guttural, echoed off the surrounding cliff faces. But it wasn't your typical thunder. The sea and the wind carried an undertone of a growl, originating from the depths of the sea itself. This sound was like no marine or terrestrial creature I've come across in my years at the park. If I had to describe it, I'd say it was like the wrath of the ocean and the eternal wild all woven into one strange sound. I couldn't help but move closer, despite the building tension. My curiosity got the best of me. The ocean, which a moment before mirrored a sheet of glass, lashed and thundered, churning with bubbles and waves as if the seafloor was ablaze. It felt like an angry disturbance rippling through the sea's very soul. Suddenly, arcing out of the water, an enormous serpent-like creature rose up from the depths. This was not any known marine animal. It was titanic, easily dwarfing the nearby container ship I mentioned earlier. Outlined against the clear sky, its scale-covered body glistened in the sun. It had broad, fin-like appendages that it used to suspend itself above the waves. Its eyes were eerie, hypnotic even, but not in a gentle way. Rather, 
they carried an unsettling malice. A malevolent intelligence I've never seen in any animal's eyes before. The brine-filled air grew thick with stench. My nostrils were assaulted with a scent as old and distinct as the ocean itself mingled with something foul. The sheer terror of that sudden reveal made my heart race. But before I could react, with a thunderous thrash of its body, it dove back into the now raging waters, creating a whirlpool so fierce the whole shore trembled. Then, as suddenly as the creature had appeared, it was gone. Some might call it a monster, but I'd say it was just another citizen of the wild that we're yet to understand. In the following days, my thoughts kept drifting back to the encounter. It was like watching the park emerge from a shared dream, with the deer grazing, the foxes playing, the birds singing. Everything slipped back into its harmonic routine, as if the chaos was a forgotten echo. You know the best part about being a ranger? It's the privilege of witnessing nature's obscure tales told by no humans but shared by the trees, the sea, the soil, and the air. This incident is another of these stories. Living at the edge of civilization brings such encounters, reminding us we've only begun to unravel the mysteries tucked away in this vast, beautiful wilderness. I have a wild story for you. This was a few years back, midsummer. Place was Two Moon Bay, a great little spot to catch some waves on the central coast of Australia. I've been in love with surfing since my dad, a champion surfer in his own right, got me on a board when I was just a little sprite. And to this day, there's just something about riding down the face of a monster wave that gets me going back into the water year after year. So, there I was, waiting in the lineup for a decent wave to come along just enjoying the clear blue sky and the sun on my back. It might sound like an odd thing for a bloke to say, but on days like those, it's almost like you're dancing with the ocean itself. We got into a rhythm where I'd spring to my feet, flying down the wall of the wave before cutting back and forth, riding the lip of the curl. Truly nothing quite matches that adrenaline rush. It was during one such ride while carving my mark on a shoulder-high wave that I noticed something odd. The water was usually crystal clear, but I saw an odd shadow under the surface. I figured it was a school of fish, or maybe even a dolphin, though none had been spotted earlier. It was strange, as the dark shape seemed too big and too still to be either. Curious, but feeling a gnawing unease starting to creep in, I decided to investigate. After riding the wave back to shore, I took a deep breath and decided to swim out towards the spot. Here's where things start to get hairy. The water was a bit cooler than expected in the area where the shadow was. That's not too abnormal itself, but the stench. It was like nothing I'd ever smelled before. It was like a fresh compost pile. Not something you'd expect to find out here in the water. There must be something else nearby, but I couldn't see anything. The shadowy figure below the water was turning even murkier by the second. I tried diving down thinking maybe there was a chunk of shipwreck buried in the sand or something. But each time I tried to get closer to the shadow, it slipped away from me, almost as though it was avoiding me. I chalked it up to a trick of light, or maybe my imagination, but then something brushed against my leg. It wasn't like seaweed or a stray jellyfish. It was firmer, dense, and definitely unnatural. I swear, my heart fell into my guts and suddenly it was all too real. Rising from the shadowy depths, an odd figure surfaced in front of me. I don't know how to say this without sounding totally off my rocker, but it looked like an alien. It was smallish, probably around my height and skinny. Its head was unmistakably larger than its body, a bit similar to those bobblehead toys. The most striking part, though, were the eyes. They were large and black like pools of ink eating up its face. As soon as I saw that thing in front of me, this feeling of pure terror gripped my guts. I bolted. Pure adrenaline pumped through my veins as I paddled back towards the shore as fast as my arms and legs would go. I barely managed to get ashore before collapsing on the sand, gasping for air and shaking like a leaf. The sense of relief that washed over me, knowing I was no longer in the ocean with that nightmare, was indescribable. 
In the days, weeks, and months following the encounter, I found myself replaying the incident in my head, over and over again. Was it truly what I think I saw? Could I have hallucinated the whole thing? Maybe it was just some inflatable toy, and I was just totally confused and mistaken. But then, I remember that dark pool and that putrid smell. It was real, as real as the sea beneath me that day. Since then, surfing hasn't been the same for me. I've been back in the water, but each time I go, I feel the shadow of that encounter. I'm still not sure what I think about that day. What was that thing doing in the ocean? Was it truly an alien, or was it some aquatic species of human? I doubt I'll ever figure it out, and part of me doesn't even want to. A couple of years ago, I was working as a park ranger at Devil's Lake State Park in Wisconsin. I loved everything about that gig, the early sunrises, the cool evening breezes, the quiet serenity of nature, and even the occasional wild animal that took a shine to me. You could say I was living my dream, until this one incident. It was a day like any other at first, but it turned quickly to an experience I still can't wrap my head around. My day always started at the crack of dawn. I'd patrol the well-used trails, check the animal tracks, pick up litter left behind by disrespectful tourists. You know, the usual stuff. Being out there in the wilderness, living off the whims of nature and doing my bit to keep her beauty intact. There was no place I'd rather be. It was a simple life, just me and the great outdoors. One day, my routine sugar maple monitoring took me to the brush line off the quartzite trail. It was a regular gig, Examine the trees for any disease, insects, measure the circumferences and all that. This day, however, the second I stepped off the trail, something seemed off. There was this smell, a stench really. All around me the air was thick with it. It was a pungent, heavy odor that I can only describe as a cross between deep earth and rotting garbage. Might not seem that odd in the wild, but it felt different. I would have dismissed it if not for my gut. I've been out in the wilderness long enough to trust my instincts. When nature talks, we should listen. I learned that the hard way, but that's a story for another time. It wasn't the terrible smell that unsettled me as much as the feeling it brought. There was a sense of wrongness, like something had visited that place that didn't belong. It was then I noticed everything was oddly quiet. Devil's Lake isn't a quiet place in my experience. There's always some bird call or rustling leaves the hum of flowing water or critter scrabbling about. The forest is never really silent, but in that instant, I swear, you could have heard a pin drop. The eerie silence I would have normally welcomed was uncharacteristically chilling. In that tranquility, however, I noticed a faint hum. Now, this is going to sound bizarre, but it was like the low buzz you'd hear around those big old power lines. But this was the wild miles away from civilization and there were no power lines around. Every instinct I had was screaming at me to turn back, but the forestry service had its procedures, and I had a job to do. Determined, I hauled my equipment further in, shrugging off these feelings, trying to convince myself it was another day in the park. And that's when I saw them, the trees. They were scarred, some kind of burn marks, all blackened and smoky, but it was just those few trees. None of the others were affected, it was as if something had scorched them. It wasn't like a wildfire. The burn marks were made precisely, methodically, even it wasn't natural. That much was clear. After taking down notes and some pictures of those trees, I looked up at the ridge above, and there, there was something. It was some sort of figure. Human, perhaps. Or maybe something else. It took me a moment to process, but by the time I did, they were gone. Now, I have no way to prove this and you're welcome to be skeptical. But remember, the wilderness doesn't care for our explanations or lack thereof. I'm not sure what happened that day or what I saw, and I sure don't know if others have experienced it too. But one thing's for certain, there's something else out there besides us. So there I was standing among the damaged trees, with that increasingly uncomfortable buzzing in my ears, the kind you'd probably hear if you stood beneath a giant power transformer which was absurd given that I was way out in the park, miles from any power source. 
Determined to get to the bottom of this, I started trudging up the forest to the ridge. The stench got worse with each step. Not just the rotting garbage smell, but a sulfur-like odor now clung to it. This is where it gets hard to explain. I've always been a creature of instinct, entrusting my life to the silent language of the wilderness many times over. But what happened up at that ridge, I still struggle to comprehend. When I reached the crest, I saw them. They were humanoid shapes of maybe four to six feet tall. They were skinny, with disproportionately large heads and black oval eyes. No noses, no mouths. They were like something straight out of those alien conspiracy theories. There were about a handful of these greys, as people call them, stationed around what looked like some sort of metallic object. They seemed to be examining their surroundings silently, telepathically communicating maybe, I don't know, and that hum, it seemed to be emanating from them. Now, I won't lie, every nerve in my body screamed to bolt, but my feet became rooted to the spot, eyes glued to the unsettling spectacle before me. They reeked, the stink mixing with the wood's natural odor, overpowered everything else. I couldn't tell you how long I stood there, staring in abject horror, my heart pounding out a stuttering rhythm against my rib cage. It may have been seconds, or maybe hours, but then one of them turned, its black eyes seeming to look right at me, through me, and the hum intensified. It broke me out of my daze. I bolted. Somehow, don't ask me how, I made it back to my office. I was sweating buckets. My heart was pounding so hard I could feel each beat resonate through me. I locked myself in for the rest of the day, trying to convince myself that what I had seen was a figment of my imagination. But the bizarre condition of the trees and the residual humming in my ears told a different story. Once evening fell and the park grew quiet, I found myself replaying the day's events over and over in my mind, my sleep plagued by the image of those creatures and the haunting hum. Had I crossed paths with extraterrestrial life? Or was it some bizarre phenomenon of nature that I had yet to understand? Consequently, I resigned a month later, unable to shake off the lingering fear that came with working in the park. Discussions with other park rangers revealed no similar experiences, and I learned that the trees eventually recuperated from what looked like burn damage. Despite several sleepless nights and an enduring unrest, I consider myself lucky for having escaped unharmed. I'm still uncertain of what happened that day. All I can do is carry the haunting memories of those black, soulless eyes and the unceasing hum, always reminding me that something out there didn't belong to this world. Let me tell you about one of my strangest investigations in my days as a park ranger in the Pacific Northwest. It was an experience that I won't forget for a lifetime. It was midsummer some years ago at Crater Lake National Park, and I found myself knee deep in reports about a few campers that had gone missing around our park's remote lake. Considering the lake was tucked away amidst a dense expanse of trees, it wasn't all too surprising for a few tourists to lose their way. These types of things would happen from time to time, but we were always able to locate the lost campers and get them back to safety. So I wasn't too alarmed at first, but I took my duties seriously. The safety of our visitors was always my top priority. One day turned into two and then three, and suddenly it was weeks that they had been missing. The odds weren't great, I hate to say. And then another group went missing too. And if I wasn't worried before, I certainly was now. I spent weeks interviewing other campers, scrutinizing each statement, and piecing together any clue that could lead me to the missing folks. Meanwhile, I checked every registered campsite for signs of disturbance or struggle. Many showed signs of a hasty departure, unmade tents, leftover food, even valuables left behind, but there were no clues as to what happened. It was as if the campers had vanished into thin air. The one thing that struck me as odd was the lack of wildlife activity around these deserted campsites. Normally, raccoons and squirrels would be all over an abandoned campsite, but they were nowhere to be found. I turned my attention to the area surrounding the lake, thinking it was a natural focal point. What I saw were the usual signs of a typical summer season. Fishing lines caught in the trees, 
discarded cans and plastic wrappers, and plenty of worn out foot trails. But as I dug deeper into the wilderness, away from the lapping waves of the lake, I started to encounter something unusual. There were these strange large footprints pressed into the dirt on some of the less trodden tracks. Now, I've seen plenty of footprints in my day, but none quite like these. They were certainly too large for any human, measuring almost two of my feet end on end. And instead of the distinctive tread of a hiking boot, these impressions were, well, barefoot. They had a peculiar roundness to them too, almost human-like, and yet not quite. My responsibilities as a park ranger rarely led me into the realm of the paranormal, but as these footprints were something else, I knew of all the stories. Everyone around here did, but I never once imagined that they might be real. There was an unusual odor that hung heavily in the air the deeper I ventured into the woods. I was familiar with the typical smells of the woods, but there was something inexplicably odd about this smell. It was a pungent, off-putting scent, a sour undertone that made me feel like I was walking into some spoiled, contaminated zone, like I was somewhere I shouldn't be. The further I tracked into the woods, the stronger the foul smell became. Just as the sun's golden glow began to sink behind the trees, I heard a sound rush through the forest, a loud long howl completely different from anything I have heard in my long years surrounded by wildlife. It reverberated through the trees and echoed off the distant mountains, making it impossible for me to discern its point of origin. Wherever it came from, I knew I wasn't alone in those woods, and the thought of who or what might be sharing this secluded wilderness with me sent a shiver down my spine. I immediately thought of the missing campers and wondered if our mystery creature had something to do with it. I wanted to investigate further, but my common sense told me to get back to the safety of the ranger station. I decided to press on. I hiked deeper into the woods, following those massive bare footprints. Curiously, they led straight towards a large, hidden cave tucked away amidst the dense thicket. I shivered a little at the entrance. Fingers numb, but the grip on my flashlight was tighter than ever. Moving aside the thick undergrowth, I cautiously ventured in. The closer I moved towards the cave, the sharper the foul smell turned. My flashlight was throwing feeble shadows against the walls of the cavern. But it didn't take long for the beam to fall upon those responsible for my ongoing mysterious puzzle. I found myself looking into the most curious beings I'd ever encountered. It was a Sasquatch family. Powerful, solid, and gargantuan would be an understatement for the creatures I came face to face with that night. I estimate their height to be close to around eight feet, perhaps just a bit taller. Their burly bodies covered in dense brown hair with a reddish tint I could just barely see in the low light. They huddled together towards the end of the cave, their deep set eyes reflecting my flashlight beam. Something about their wide nostrils flaring and their rough scarred faces showed me they were as startled by this encounter as I was. A deep, resonant snarl echoed in the cave. Their bulky shoulders moved in the shadows as the colossal being shifted uneasily. In that instant, I felt an overwhelming mix of fear and respect. Here was a moment of discovery I felt strangely privileged to have, but with it came a realization that my intentions could pose a threat to their existence. I thought again about the missing campers. If these things were responsible, then I was likely to meet the same fate if I stayed there much longer. Nearly stumbling back over my own feet, I slowly retreated, the flashlight bearing my erratic movements. I managed to give them one last look, and those intelligent, worried eyes burned into my consciousness as I turned around and headed back towards my cabin. The night was much longer than usual, and sleep barely floated on the surface. I was surrounded by a different set of truths than what was known and accepted by the public. I wrestled with thoughts of reporting them to my superiors, but I ultimately decided against it. Whatever they were, they let me go and I figured I would return the favor. In their seclusion, it seemed to me like they wanted to be left in peace and anonymity. And so, they stayed hidden from the world, in the deepest secret I ever held on to. The old folk tales wore a fresh coat of reality and I found myself adding layers to those already established. The footprints, the odors, the howls, these were now validated as signs of the existence of a magnificent creature I had come across. 
I never revisited the cave, nor did I share the exact coordinates with anyone else. Their existence remained a secret I bore alone. I was a changed man, a person privy to a secret that was as old as the wilderness itself. As for the issue of the missing folks, though, I began to enforce stricter park rules, halting camping in secluded spots, and introducing hiking companions for anyone willing to adventure into the deep forest. That was the most I could do without revealing the secret I held. This ordeal happened on an evening shift I spent working at Guadalupe Mountains National Park. It's located in the great state of Texas, west of Carlsbad Cavern if you're looking to place it on a map. I'm a park ranger there. It's a pretty good gig, I've got to admit. No two days are ever the same out there. Plus, I don't have to be stuck behind some clammy office desk all day. I wouldn't survive doing that, I'm sure of it. However, the day I want to talk to you about was not something I ever expected to encounter out there. It began pretty ordinary at first. I'd just started my shift in the later afternoon. I arrived at the main office. I put on my uniform, sprayed on some bug spray, laced up my boots and got my gear loaded into the truck. As a ranger, my responsibilities may be many, but the core of it is always human and nature interaction. We look out for wildlife, making sure they're keeping to themselves and not getting too friendly with visitors. We maintain the trail system, handle any erosion in the trafficked areas, not to mention dealing with all the campers who think it's a good idea to feed the animals. So there I was, cruising through in my truck, checking on my zone like it was any other day. The air had that nice chill, the type that goes right through your clothes if you aren't wearing proper layers. The graying light was gently turning the mountains a lavender hue, like some artist took a brush to them. This is why I like the evening shift. I decided to make a stop at a remote picnic area called Pine Springs. I needed to reset a few trail signs and make sure things were as they should be. I parked the truck, got out, and stretched, enjoying the quiet that was to be found at that time of day. I had the spare signpost in one hand and hardware in the other. As I was working on fixing the sign, a strange feeling washed over me. You know that sensation where you suddenly feel like you're not alone? It was like that. It felt colder and emptier than any normal evening breeze. I halted, screwdriver in hand, and looked around, partly expecting to see a coyote out of its den or some other woodland creature. But it was just me. At least, that's what I thought. After double-checking my surroundings, I told myself that it was probably a play of wind currents or just late-night jitters. I rolled my eyes at my overactive imagination and finished up the post-adjustment but something deep inside was warning me. This wasn't just another shift. There was something strange going on here. Then, out of nowhere, a loud buzzing hit my ears. It felt like thousands of bees. It was like I had stuck my head in a hornet's nest. I shook my head and double-checked my surroundings once more. Was it another vehicle? A plane? Nothing. With all these strange happenings, my heart was pounding in my chest. I knew something wasn't right here and quickly radioed the ranger station. But I couldn't get through and so there was no response. Just that incessant humming noise. I tried my cell and even that was acting up. It was like all electronic devices decided to go on a strike. Just as I was turning to hop in my truck, something caught my eye. There, right above the grove of trees, was this thing. I don't even know how to describe it. It looked smooth and round almost spherical, but not perfectly so, and it was almost undetectable with my eyes, but the humming sound gave it away. From the distance I was at, I'd say it was only a few feet across, and entirely metallic. I appeared to be glowing softly, casting an eerie light down onto the pine trees below. It just hovered there. I felt this inexplicable shudder run down my spine. Then it moved like nothing I've ever seen. It was quick and sharp, one moment it was over the trees, and the next, it was swooping low, right over my head. Once it passed, the humming dulled down, and then it was gone as if it was never even there. I was left standing there, my heart pounding like a jackhammer, just staring at the night sky, the only lights being the distant stars and my truck's headlights. 
The rest of the night was a blur. I remember getting back in my truck and making it back to the ranger station, not daring to glance at my rearview mirror. I spent the rest of the night wide awake, pondering the bizarre events. What was that thing? Where did it go? And why here, in a remote national park of all places? Come morning, I looked for any evidence of that strange encounter. My tire tracks were still there, and so were my scattered tools by the signpost, but no sign of any metallic object or unusual tracks anywhere. It was as if it had never happened. You might think I dreamed it all up, but I know what I saw, and I know that it was real. As for my thoughts on that encounter, I don't know what to think anymore. I've been pondering over whether to share this peculiar story for a while now. It's not something I talk about often. It happened a couple of years ago when I'd taken a trip out to Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. That's in Michigan if you're not familiar with the area. I went by myself, which is something I don't normally do, but I wanted some time alone in nature. It had been a particularly stressful few weeks, and I needed some downtime to just relax. Except, that's not what was in store for me that day. I started my day just as any visitor would do in a state park, hiking. It was an ordinary day, or at least appeared to be. Quite sunny, pretty nice, really. The greenery, the natural sounds of the woods, the cool wind, all just perfect to clear up a cluttered mind. The trails in the area were well marked and there weren't many folks around. I was surprised, given how nice of a day it was. Hours trickled by unnoticed. I spotted a few squirrels and deer along the way. Birdsong filled the air. It was just what I needed. However, as dusk settled in, I found myself on a less trodden path. I'm not sure how exactly I got there. If I had accidentally made a wrong turn, or if this was just the route. But the landscape started to get more rugged than I was prepared for. But the beauty of it, this seemingly untouched spot of nature, it was too perfect to feel any regret. Out of nowhere, I caught an odd feeling, creeping up the back of my neck. You know how you get that weird feeling when you can't see anything out of place, but somehow you know you're being watched? Yeah, that one. I suppose the woods felt somewhat silent, quieter than it had been. The chirping birds had receded, and a certain heaviness hung in the air that didn't seem to be present before. Initially, I chalked it up to the wild playing mind games. It was getting dark and there was an undeniable creepiness to the woods at night. Maybe there's nothing out there but the shadows obscured my vision, enough to be worried. If there was anything out there, I likely wouldn't know it. A weird rustling sound then broke the silence, far behind me in the undergrowth. It sounded too heavy to be a small critter. I turned around, peering into the darkness, but I saw nothing. I was spooked. I decided to head back. My way back was plagued by that unsettling feeling of being watched. I swore for a moment that I heard a soft laughter, or maybe a whisper. I know it sounds crazy. It was like the wind was churning out whispers through the trees or something. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew I wanted to get out of there. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I tried to stay calm and told myself that it was just the wind playing tricks on me, nothing else. But what happened next was something straight out of a nightmare. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a fleeting movement in the shadows. Every time I turned to face it, the shadow had vanished. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was toying with me, like how a cat plays with a mouse before it kills it. And then there it was. Standing in the clearing under the moonlight was the silhouette of what looked like a man. He was tall, maybe about seven feet or so, lanky and silent. The sight was jarring in such a remote wilderness setting. I continued staring at the strange person, fear spreading like ice in my veins. The silence returned, only this time it felt loaded. The figure started changing right in front of my eyes, body contorting in impossible ways, until it was no longer a man. The transformation was disturbing, to say the least. It shrunk back into the shadows, and when it emerged again, it had become a wolf-like creature. Its eyes were glowing, or at least seemed to under the moonlight. But the wolf wasn't quite right. If you saw it wandering around the wild, you would recognize it as a wolf, but you would be able to tell something was off about it. You might not be able to pinpoint it, but you would know. The creature was tall and agile, 
It moved around the clearing before turning to look straight at me. Caught in its gaze, I felt a sudden danger, an all-consuming dread. The wind picked up again, carrying with it a musky and earthy scent, like a rain-soaked forest floor. Then, out of nowhere, it started laughing, laughing that got louder over the mix of rustling leaves and my pounding heartbeat. It was a human-like laughter, chilling me to the bone. I won't lie. I ran. Any bravado evaporated in the face of what looked inexplicably supernatural. I could hear it behind me as I ran, the soft padding on the forest floor closing in on me. But then, just as suddenly, it was gone. And just like that, the stalking, the eerie sounds, everything was gone. There was only me, panting heavily, pushing through the woods to reach safety. I managed to get back to my vehicle, though that night's image never quite left me. Every shadow felt like those unnatural eyes watching me, every gust of wind like that laughter mocking me. I questioned my sanity, my decision, the reality of that encounter. It just didn't make sense. No one would have believed me. With time, I tried to convince myself that it was a case of fear-induced hallucination. But, you know what? I know what I saw. It was real. I'm not much of a nature buff, but there's something about standing among those colossal redwood trees that grips you by the soul. Not that I'm the poetic type. Anyway, this all happened a while back when I was visiting Humboldt Redwood State Park. It's up north in California and can be quite the trek from the usual tourist bustle. There's this extraordinary tranquility there. It's a bit like stepping into another world. I've seen pictures, sure, but no picture ever did those trees any justice. What you can't see in pictures is that profound stillness that hangs in the air, only broken by the occasional sigh of the wind through the branches. It's humbling standing there, dwarfed by these gnarled giants that stretch up into the sky. It seems like they're almost touching the clouds. I remember it was a bright, cool day, with the air smelling of damp earth. Fragments of sunlight pierce through the trees. The awe those trees inspire, it warrants respect, and the cool shade those leafy behemoths cast. It made for a nice respite against the afternoon sun. I fancied a quieter hike, preferring the lesser-used trails to the more populated ones, where you'd bump into folks every couple of yards. I'd much rather run into squirrels than the weekend warrior crowd. So off I went. It was during one of these solitary treks, off the beaten path, crunching over the thick blanket of pine needles, that I had this eerie encounter. I must have been about half a day's hike in, heading towards a place called Tall Trees Grove. Now, if you know your trees you'd know those towering redwoods can live up to a few thousand years. Talking about some serious old-timers here. I appreciate them, the silence, the sense of calm they exude. A guy could lose himself in a place like that, in a good way, of course. I was well into the underbrush by then, maybe getting a bit too comfortable in the silence and the raw beauty of it. There was a light filtering down through the trees. The forest was chiming with the soft rustle of leaves and the far-off call of some bird. That's when I heard it, a low rustle different from the movements of the other creatures in the forest. It sounded like there was something big stirring close by. My heart started beating faster, but it did little to muffle that rustling sound that seemed to be growing louder and closer. Gradually, the natural sounds of the forest stilled, replaced by an ominous quiet that smothered everything in its presence. My mouth turned dry and I had this strange feeling, something I can't describe. Needless to say, that half day's hike back to safety felt a whole lot longer right about then. I strained my ears to hear something, anything that might clue me in to what was traipsing around out there. I couldn't see anything and hoped it was just a deer rustling in the underbrush, but my gut was saying something different. There was a distinct sensation of being watched, of being hunted. I can't describe it any other way. The eerie quiet continued, broken by my heavy breathing and the pounding of my heart in my chest. It felt like I had trespassed some untold boundary and something was not at all happy about it. And that was when I first saw it. It was a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. There was definitely something out here. 
An uneasiness coiled at the pit of my stomach, whispering warnings that things were about to get dangerous if I stayed there. I spun around, squinting towards the source of movement. The forest was gathered in silence again, the birds and critters themselves seemingly holding their breath in anticipation. Craning my neck, I caught sight of what every instinct of mine was screaming against. There was a pair of yellow eyes glaring from the shaded undergrowth. Its eyes had an unnatural shine to them, sort of glowing in a way that froze me on the spot. The enormity of the being attached to those golden glowing eyes is something that I find hard to describe. Standing on two legs, it carried a chilling resemblance to a dinosaur, or maybe a lizard. The way it moved upright was remarkably humanoid, and yet it was very much not. Its head, now that was a sight I won't ever forget. It reminded me of a monitor lizard and sported a wicked set of sharp teeth. The sight of those teeth paired with the fearsome claws that ended its scaly limbs left a sinking feeling in my belly. I knew then I was in trouble big, terrifying trouble. I can't really articulate the fear that encounter triggered in me. I felt acutely aware, in that moment, that this creature, alien to my world, was not to be trifled with. It was the predator here. I was not. With a final glare, it lumbered into the concealing underbrush. The way it moved was strange but silent, much too silent for a creature its size. For whatever reason, it had decided to leave me alone. I don't know why, but I was grateful. I felt my knees buckle as I sank onto the ground, shaky breaths echoing in the sudden stillness. I stayed there, frozen. My mind was muddled with terror, confusion, and relief all at once. I mustered every ounce of courage left in me, bolted onto my feet, and retreated from where I had come, half expecting the creature to lunge at me any moment, but it was gone. The forest felt different around me then, the trees no longer familiar the path stranger, fraught with an unseen danger that was far too real to ignore. I could barely remember my way back as the adrenaline carried me through the untrodden paths and back to the safety of civilization. That experience, it shook me to the core. I've since found myself turning it over in my mind incessantly, wrestling with the reality of what happened. Was it real or just my imagination playing tricks? If it was real, then what was that thing? Days turned into weeks. The memory stayed, gnawing at the edge of my mind. I haven't visited that forest since, nor any other for that matter. I couldn't shake off the eeriness that encounter left within me. Needless to say, the carefree man that entered the forest that day was not the man who walked out. So, this happened when I was working as a park ranger at the Congaree National Park in South Carolina. Congaree is a special place. It's a vast, swampy, old-growth forest that could make even the most seasoned outdoorsmen feel like they might just be wandering onto something magical and primal. I might just have the best office in the world, at least in my opinion. On this particular night, I was out patrolling. We had quite a few incidents involving fishermen breaking the rules that summer, either fishing without a license or taking more than the limit. We weren't sure why, but was something I had to keep an eye on. Mostly, the perpetrators thought they could get away with it at night, which is why we had increased nighttime patrols. So there I was, working the night shift in Congaree. Nighttime in the park is something else. Owls hooting, coyotes howling in the distance, Lots of activity as the forest peculiar nightlife awaken. A symphony of peeper frogs singing in the swamp. I loved it, but I could see how it might seem spooky from time to time. It was basically the soundtrack of a horror film, if you thought about it that way. That night I was making my way around the Cedar Creek path. The moon was just a faint glimmer behind the clouds, providing just enough light that I didn't have to use a flashlight just yet. Something gave me pause, though, a feeling like I wasn't alone. I've spent enough nights in the woods to know when something's not right. At first, I brushed it off. It's the swamp, after all. A strange noise or an unexpected movement is all part of the package. However, this felt different. This one was a kind of silence that doesn't belong in a forest. I was nearing one of the older and less explored regions of the park when I noticed a stench 
that was distinctly different from the usual earthy, mossy smells you get used to in the wild. It was a sulfur-like smell. Now, here's where things started getting weird. I picked up a bizarre figure around five feet tall moving through the tall, sharp-edged sawgrass. I couldn't make it out clearly, but it moved swiftly on legs that were oddly angled, like they were hocked. There was something unnerving about it, but I couldn't see it clearly enough to figure out what. The silhouette looked almost like a deer. It appeared almost skeletal with a weird outer contour. I thought maybe it was just a distressed animal, tangled up in something. But then I noticed its shape more clearly. It was like some nightmarish cross between regions of the animal kingdom that aren't supposed to meet. Too big for a coyote, too strange for a bear, and definitely not any herpetological creature I can reckon. The alarms in my head were going off, but still, I followed. There was a dreadful fascination about it. I had to know what it was. I moved towards the creature. The cracked twigs and disturbed underbrush indicated I was not the first to pass through this way that night. I turned a corner around a thicket of palmettos, my flashlight gripping the sweeping branches, and then I saw it. It wasn't an animal, nor a person. It was a thing, some sort of alien creature, a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. From where I stood, it seemed almost five feet, maybe six including those bizarre protuberances, which at first I took for branches stuck into matted fur, but which later I realized, to a growing horror, were, in fact, wings. They were the kind you see on bats or similar critters. No feathers, just webbed membranes stretched across its limbs. I was too fixated on the creature to worry about my safety. It was beyond belief. The head of this monstrosity was elongated like a horse's head, but the features seemed to be constantly twisting, like it might be some kind of shapeshifter. I remember its eyes were yellow and glowing against the shine of my flashlight. The creature just stood there staring at me. It seemed inquisitive almost. I stared back at it in a state of sheer confusion and terror. I watched as its long black tongue slithered from its mouth and tracing the contours of its face. It licked at the air, as if it were trying to use its tongue to smell like a snake. Parts of its body had hair like a deer, while others looked like it was sheathed in some kind of tight, scaly skin that shimmered in the light of my flashlight. I stumbled back, my heart tripping over its beats, my mind screaming at me to run, but I stood my ground. I have no idea what possessed me to do so. With a final glance at me, the creature spread its grotesque wings wide. An uncanny, ear-splitting shriek filled the air as it took flight and disappeared into the darkness. I rushed back to the station, senseless with what I'd seen. I tried to put my thoughts down into words, to rationalize it, but it was useless. I had encountered a creature something straight out of a horror novel. In the days that followed, I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder during my rounds, half anticipating and half dreading another encounter. The once familiar grounds of the Congaree National Park took on a sinister form. I didn't enjoy working the night shift anymore. I avoided it if at all possible, and the nights I did have to work, I stayed in my truck. Whether you believe my tale or not, I hope you heed caution if you ever decide to take a visit to Congaree National Park. It's a beautiful place, but I wouldn't go there after dark if I were you. The woods hold secrets beyond our understanding, so... All I can say is always watch your back. I'd like to share an experience from about five years ago. It was back in the summer of 2016, and it was a day I'll never forget. I found myself standing in front of the notorious Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Kentucky. The number of horror stories attached to that place is enough to make your skin crawl but I had it in mind that I was cut from a different cloth. Exploring abandoned buildings had become a bit of a pastime for me, especially ones that accompanied a good ghost story. But this one was different. I had a personal stake. My grandmother had worked there as a nurse before the place was shut down, and I just had to see it for myself. I remember it well. My journey began on a hot afternoon. It was one of those days that's just so hot, your clothes stick to you. The first step inside the sanatorium felt like stepping into a different time. Dry leaves filled the halls and birds had taken up roost in the ceilings and windowsills. 
The silence in the building was a character of its own. It was this ever-present thing that seemed to follow me around from room to room. This place was once a critical haven during the TB epidemic, but now it was decrepit and decaying in solitude. Walking through the deserted halls, I could almost see the hustle of patients and doctors that once filled this building. The worn-out walls, the faded wallpapers, and the stained tiles had seen so much life and death. If only this place could talk, I thought to myself. I continued on my walk. After a while, I found a room filled with old, discarded medical equipment. The rusted bed frames, dilapidated wheelchairs, and broken bottles seemed to desperately hold on to their purpose. I remember distinctly standing in front of an old, drained hydrotherapy tub. I had heard tales of these tubs from Grandma, about how they were filled with ice-cold water to reduce the patient's high temperature. And then, the weirdest thing happened. As I stretched my hand to touch the tub's corroded surface, I felt a sudden chill. The room was still hot, but I felt the hair on my arms stand on end. I shook it off, blaming my nerves for running wild in such an intimidating place. But as I delved further into the building, the temperature kept dropping. I kept hearing these distant sounds. They were hard to make out at first, but started becoming more clear as I ventured deeper into the building. At one point, I was sure I heard a child sobbing. As a father myself, it was that empathetic part of me that decided to investigate the noise. I followed the crying through the corridor, pausing every now and then to make sure I was going in the right direction. All of a sudden, a calming scent filled the room. It was a perfume of some sort, a fragrance of lilacs that seemed so out of place here. It was like something my grandmother would wear. I was beginning to fear that I wasn't alone in this rundown building. I continued towards the source of the crying, but every time I took a step forward, the sound seemed to move a step back. It was like a twisted game of cat and mouse. Following a gut feeling, I moved towards one of the small rooms that were used as patient quarters. I stepped inside and the crying echoed louder in the hollow space. Hesitantly, I slowly turned my flashlight towards the room. The beam cut through the darkness. At first I couldn't see clearly because of the dust particles in the air, but once they settled, I saw something absolutely horrifying. My flashlight landed on a small figure huddled in the middle of the room. My blood ran cold when I realized what it was. In front of me was a translucent figure of a little girl. She wasn't real like you and me, but she was there, and her crying was as real as it gets. She wore a faded gown that hung loosely on her thin frame. Her eyes were hollow and infinitely sad. She twisted her hands together as she whimpered softly. Hello, I called out hesitantly. As soon as the words left my mouth, she looked up, finally noticing my presence. Her hands flew up to wipe her eyes. She opened her mouth as if to respond, but no words came out and only a low moan filled the room. My legs felt like lead, but I took a step towards her. Can you, can you hear me? I asked again. This time she nodded. The next moments were a blur of fear and adrenaline. I tried asking questions, but her mute nods and head shakes were the only answers I had. I asked if she was alone, if she needed help. At this, she merely lowered her head, the sadness in her eyes deepening, and then she vanished. She was just, all of a sudden, gone. I stood there, stunned for I don't know how long. When I finally came to my senses, I was alone again. No signs of the ghost girl or any other apparitions. I returned home, unable to shake off the encounter from my mind. Was that little girl indeed a ghost? What happened to her? And how long has she been trapped in that place? I've heard tales of ghosts and spirits, but this was more real and more frightening than any of the stories I had come across. Sometimes, when I'm alone in the dark, I still feel a ghostly presence around. The desperation in her hollow eyes still haunts me. Part of me wishes I could have helped her or done something to ease her suffering. But the other part knows full well that there are some things you don't mess around with in this world, and the spirit world is one of them. I've got an eerie incident to tell you about that happened during one of my night shifts as a security guard in an industrial factory. I still can't make much sense of it. It wasn't any special or classified factory or anything. 
nothing strange about it, at least not at first. It was in the business suburbs of Dayton, Ohio. Most of my nights were spent sitting alone and staring at monitors. I would do patrols of the building on foot, but I never caught up with or saw anything out of the ordinary. Every once in a while, someone forgot to lock their office door, but that was about it. No big deal. The factory manufactured car parts for various auto companies. My shift started at 10 p.m. and ended at 6 a.m., and my primary duty was to keep the property and its assets safe from external threats. There weren't many people out there looking to steal factory-made car parts, so my main adversaries were time and boredom. Every hour, I'd do security checks, a full sweep of the premises, the factory floor, the administrative offices, the warehouses. Every corner was covered during those rounds. Those strolls were the only exercise I got all night, and they actually helped to keep me awake. The more significant part of the job, though, was keeping an eye on the surveillance footage. A whole series of monitors scanned and recorded any movement on the factory grounds, both inside or out. The video feeds were black and white, grainy like old film. Management didn't want to spend the money for a new system, so we were stuck with this. It wasn't perfect, but it worked good enough for the bosses, so I was okay with it too. One particular Friday night, more accurately, very early Saturday morning, I was going through my usual routine. I finished my midnight rounds and returned to my security hub. It was then when I first noticed something unusual. I was gazing at the monitor showing footage from the storage area when I spotted a flicker of movement. At first, I brushed it off as a poor quality in the system, but then it happened again. On the screen, a slightly darker shadow hovered at the corner. Now, mind you, at that hour in the dead silence, even the smallest abnormality feels amplified. But this, this was feeling like my own personal Twilight Zone episode. This shadow seemed to move independently. Its edges were blurry. I would describe it as looking closer to a patch of dense fog than a definite silhouette. Yet, for it to appear in the middle of a dry, well-maintained room seemed improbable, if not impossible. It hovered, swaying gently in one corner of the storage area. At one point, it seemed to take the form of a human, but I couldn't properly tell. The footage quality wasn't great. Part of me wanted this to be a dusty camera revealing rat or a raccoon. But deep down, I was afraid. I tried to brush off my unease. Taking a deep breath, I decided to go and check on the moving shadow. I don't know if this would be better or worse than confronting a living intruder. I didn't know how it would react when I showed up. But part of me was convinced that this couldn't be real, that I was letting my imagination get the better of me. So, armed with just my flashlight and an old sturdy wrench, I ventured into the cold, silent factory halls. My heart was pounding in my ears. As I neared the storage area, the air changed. The usual musty smell was replaced with a faint scent of roses. I paused, completely baffled by the situation. I felt a chill run down my spine. Something was undoubtedly not right here. I cautiously opened the storeroom door and shone my flashlight directly at the corner, where I'd seen the anomaly. The beam seemed to almost stick to the strange, foggy figure instead of passing through. I gasped as the shadow slowly turned to face me. Distorted yet discernible features were visible. It had these piercingly bright hollow eyes, glowing white in the murky room. As my gaze locked with those glowing eyes, I could feel a jolt of sadness, a silent plea hauntingly coming from the ethereal figure. There was a strange air about the figure, but it wasn't the danger or malice that I previously thought. The figure's apparent sorrow made my stomach churn. I dropped the wrench. The loud clang of it echoed around the room. And then, in less than a blink, the ghostly figure vanished. It was like it was never even there, except for the very faint scent of roses that hung in the air. I bolted out of the room and back to the safety of my small security hut. I replayed the surveillance footage. It captured everything, even the moment that the figure disappeared into thin air. I sat there in disbelief, trying to come to terms with what just happened. I managed to see the rest of the shift through. I reported to my replacement guard at 6 a.m. He brushed off my shaken expressions as a joke, but before I left, I told him to take a look at the security footage if he didn't believe me. There wasn't any more joking after that. 
I've kept an eye out for the strange figure on the monitors, but I haven't seen anything since that night. Maybe my confrontation with it scared it away. Who knows? But what gets me is what was it doing there? What connection did it have to the factory? Or maybe it was looking for something from even further in the past. I did a little digging, but I couldn't find much information about the place before the factory was built. Perhaps I'll never know.